Today's lesson is a story about three little goblins. White people are better than black people. Men should be in charge. Straight people are morally superior to homosexuals. We're going to discuss how their little goblin beliefs are really the same story. Tribalism. A story of self versus other. And if we let that story grow and fester, it becomes fascism. When we dig a little deeper, however, our lesson starts to go off the rails. Because the goblin story is actually our story. In fact, the story of tribalism is the central narrative of Western culture. And it's all based on the same destructive mythology. The myth of the other. When I think about Nazi Germany, you know what terrifies me more than the actual Holocaust? The scariest part of that history is that Germany, as a collective people, willingly adopted a narrative of genocide. In the novel Ishmael, author Daniel Quinn asks the reader to imagine life in Germany in the 1930s, to consider that regular folks who considered themselves good and moral people democratically elected the defining villain of modern history. How is the average German deceived? The milkman, the friendly neighbor, the shop owner. How did they allow for such a descent into madness? Was it fear? Were they afraid of Hitler? Was it his charisma, his skill as an orator? Would fear or a good speech be enough to convince you to become a literal Nazi? There was a compelling story. The German people had felt trampled for so long, kicked into the mud at the end of World War I, and when the shockwaves of America's Great Depression hit 10 years later, things went from bad to brutal. The German people felt demoralized, unfairly diminished on the global stage. And along came a politician with a story of who to blame for their woes. A charismatic leader, yes, but with a story of victimhood, of justice, of patriotic nationalism. He had a story of how to reclaim the righteous power of their mythic past. Make America great again. It's an easy sell to a desperate population. Your life sucks, and it's the immigrants' fault. Not everybody bought into this particular us versus them story, but enough people did. Imagine you're a German in the 1930s. This fanatic politician is rising to power, saying some unsettling things. Maybe you would have had doubts. Maybe you would have felt something wasn't quite right, or even had enough self-awareness to ask the incredibly difficult question. Hans, are we the baddies? But if you're convinced that you would have been anti-Hitler, before you recline into your moral superiority, remember, most people around you drank the Kool-Aid. Hitler won democratic elections. His story was compelling. This is what terrifies me, how easily the average person can be swept up in such a story. I believe in the purity of races. Gender is determined by chromosomes. You can't just decide to change it. A woman's place is in the kitchen or in her man's bed. Just like the fascists and the goblins, we are captive to a similar story. You, me, everybody. Our story may not be genocidally anti-Semitic, but it is no less toxic. This story is all around us, even now in this very room, as I talk to you. I'd like you to take a moment and try to think, what story are we captive to? This is a bit of a trick question. 
If you're living inside of an all-encompassing story, it's nearly impossible to see it for what it really is. If a story is constantly whispered into your ear, whispered into your ear, whispered into your ear, every day, from every direction, it's not a story for you. It's, it's simply your reality. reality. David Foster Wallace describes this best. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? <laughs> the point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. How do you describe water to a fish? How do we see what our story looks like? We need perspective. Let's consider what stories in the past looked like. The ancient Greeks had an all-encompassing story. It involved Zeus, Athena, Poseidon, a whole pantheon of larger-than-life characters. The Vikings had a story of Odin, Thor, and Freya, stories of humanity emerging from nature itself. The Egyptians had their own stories of gods and goddesses, pharaohs as living deities. What, what, what do we call those stories? When we talk about Greek gods, we're talking about Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Egyptian, Mayan, Chinese, Roman, Japanese, and Jewish mythology. Every culture in history has had a set of mythological beliefs, a central narrative implicitly understood by everybody. So what's our mythology? What, like the creationists? We don't have a mythology. We're into science and verifiable data. I'm a believer in logic and evolution and rationality. I certainly don't believe in any myths. The Greeks didn't think their stories were mythology either. They legitimately believed in the pantheon of gods. What we call Greek mythology was just Greek reality, what they knew, their narrative. This is true of all cultures, including ours. Well, then what's our narrative? Our collective story, the narrative implicitly understood by everybody, is the belief that we are all individuals. The mythology of Western civilization is the belief that there is a self, there is an other, and those two entities come into conflict. In a word, tribalism. Let me clarify what I mean by tribalism. I don't mean native folk who use the term to describe organization into tribes. The other definition of tribalism is the behaviors and attitudes that stem from strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group. This version of tribalism, zealous loyalty to one's own, is completely normal, biological. Humans have existed in tribes since before we were even humans, before we could talk. We are tribal mammals. But Western, modern tribalism is more extreme, it's not just loyalty to one's own tribe. It involves a hierarchy. Nearly everybody in our culture considers their self distinct from the other. I think of myself as an individual, as do you. So any description of the separation between self and other sounds absurdly obvious. I might as well be calling the sky blue. It's just something we take for granted. Of course we're all individuals. Of course. But if we take this separation one step further, if we say the other isn't just separate from the self, but it's less than the self, well, we get our three little goblins and their goblin beliefs. The man is the head of the household. 
You're one of the good ones. Love the sinner, hate the sin. To hold these beliefs, to be any degree of racist, sexist, or queer phobic, is to make a distinction between my group and your group. Self versus other. More power, less power. The foundation of the goblin beliefs is the separation of self from other. Tribalism. To own slaves, to deny women reproductive rights, to deny gays the right to marry, to deny trans folk the right to even exist. The level of violence varies depending on what period of history you're in, but it's always the same tribalist story. It's always oppression. The distinction of the in-group versus the out-group. The creation of a hierarchy with the self above the other. That's so gay. Of course Jesus was white. Come on, baby. Give me a smile. This self above other framework is the root of every evil act committed in this world. Nazi Germany is the quick and easy example. It is a story of the Aryans othering the Jews, the disabled, the minorities. The Holocaust, or any genocide, is an extreme manifestation of the self versus other mentality. It is to say, those others are so abhorrent, such a drag on society, they must be cleansed. But we don't need genocide to see the evils of othering. Even the more common monsters, rapists, child abusers, people who talk at the movies, their evil acts are expressions of the same story, subjugating a victim, an other, by saying, my desires outweigh your needs, as a justification for violence. Our goblins, with their little goblin beliefs, may not be as extreme as these other monsters, but it's the same story. It's tribalist othering. Build the wall. She's such a bitch. Build the wall. What a f it. As a culture, we can't seem to reckon with these injustices. America is overflowing with misogyny, Me Too stories, bigotry, transphobia, police brutality, and the never-ending struggle of the Black Lives Matter movement. These problems persist because the very foundation of our culture is the self versus other tribalist mythology. Our culture teaches us to be self-interested individuals, and once we all believe this, we can easily be taught to demonize the other. Capitalism is the perfect economic system for this mythology. Not just systemically, the few exploit the many, but on an individual level too. You work hard, you earn success. Your income is extracted from other people. The money you make is yours, and you should keep it all for yourself. We are saturated in this mythology, with capitalist marching orders. So of course, we all believe that we are individuals. I'm not buying it, guy. My individuality isn't a myth. There's nobody like me. Are you honestly arguing that I'm not an individual? I'm trying to describe the water that you are swimming in, the narrative that has engulfed us all, that covers our eyes like a veil. If you went back to ancient Greece and had a conversation with an Athenian, and you tried to tell her that the Greek gods were all just mythology, that Zeus and all the rest don't actually exist, she'd think you were speaking gibberish. You might as well be telling her that the sky, the rain, or mountains don't exist. She spent her whole life entrenched in that mythology, swimming in that water, some rando on the street describing a reality incompatible with her own isn't going to convince her of anything. So if you're watching this and you think I'm speaking gibberish by questioning our fundamental reality, realize this basic truth. When a story envelops you like ours does, it's nearly impossible to see outside of it. 
The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. We are swimming in our mythology like fish in water. This mythology is the lens through which we see the world, and we are held captive by it. If your mind even starts to wander off the reservation, a lifetime of social conditioning yells at you to ignore, deny, or fight against new information, to stay with the status quo, to stay in the water. But here's the thing. This individualistic understanding of the world is not the only story. There are other ways to understand reality and our place in it. It is incredibly difficult to step outside of our mythology. How do you explain dry land to a fish? I think the only way to really, truly understand our tribalist story as a mythology is to see what a different narrative looks like. To step out of the water into an entirely different story. So let's talk philosophy. I believe the most compelling argument against the self versus other binary is found in the jewel net of Indra. Behold, in my domain there is an infinite jewel net, interconnected, interdependent, incomprehensible. You must leave your mortal understanding behind. <laughs> I can't narrate this whole chapter in the voice of a god. Let's just talk. The jewel net of Indra is a vast, interconnected web, like a spider web, but three-dimensional, that extends infinitely in all directions. At each eye of this net, anywhere strands connect, there is a jewel. Since the net is infinite in size, there are an infinite number of jewels. These jewels are perfectly reflective, so if you look in any single jewel, you can see the reflections of every other jewel on the net. And if you look real close at any jewel in that reflection, you can see again the reflection of all other jewels. The point is that there are reflections in reflections in reflections, ad infinitum. To look into any single jewel is to see the entire jeweled net. This perfect reflection isn't just beautiful, it's also metaphysical. It describes our existence. The reflections create a form of interdependence. If we were to destroy, smash, or otherwise harm any jewel, that would affect literally every other jewel on the net, because the damage would be visible inside every reflection. In this way, each jewel is dependent on every other jewel. To change one is to change them all. This interdependence can be difficult to understand. Imagine a regular spider web right outside your house. If the web was empty and you took a scalpel and sliced one tiny strand near the middle of the web, what would happen? The whole web wouldn't collapse. But since every strand is load-bearing, the entire web would shift. Slightly, maybe imperceptibly, but the web would be a different shape. Thus, it would no longer be the same web. The web as a whole is dependent on every single strand, just as Indra's net is dependent on every single jewel. This philosophy was first described in ancient Hindu texts, the Vedas, about 2,500 years ago. But when Indian religion and philosophy traveled to China a couple hundred years later, a sect of Zen Buddhists, the Huayan Buddhists, subscribed to this mythology and made it their own. You see, each jewel represents a dharma, 
In Indian philosophy, a dharma is a fundamental chunk of existence. People, objects, emotions, ideas, any and everything that exists is a dharma. So on this infinite net, comprised of glittering dharmas, you are a jewel, Sophie is a jewel, this button, the conception of a perfect circle, the emotion fear, each of our three little goblins, the color purple, every nonsensical YouTube comment, every possible thing is a distinct jewel on this infinite web. The Huayan Buddhist uses this allegory to understand and describe reality. She doesn't see herself as separate from others, separate from nature, separate from anything. She is a dharma jewel that is dependent on every other dharma in existence. She believes that if she harms any other entity, she harms herself. She is truly interdependent. Now, yes, this is some cosmic hippy-dippy shit. The story of interdependence is a complete contradiction to our Western values, to our mythology. It is unlike the water in which we are swimming. But if your reaction to hearing Hindu, Buddhist, or Native American mythology is immediately dismissing it as crazy, fantastical, or less than our narrative, that's tribalism at work. I'm not trying to get you to trade in one myth for another. We're discussing the jewel net of Indra because it has practical value for us. It offers us a new lens to observe the world. The Huayan story of interdependence is a strong rebuttal to the goblin beliefs. To be racist, to be sexist, to be queerphobic is to say, they are not like me. But the Huayan Buddhist says, you've got it all wrong, little goblins. Women aren't different than men. Black people aren't different than white people. Queer folk aren't different than the breeders. We're all just interconnected dharmas on this jeweled net. To hold a goblin belief is to misunderstand Buddhist reality. It doesn't make any sense for a goblin to believe that he is a superior race, gender, or orientation, because the goblin is nothing but an infinite reflection of everyone and everything around him. Same with us. We are just reflections of reflections of reflections. Hold on. The story implies that we are all the same, which is false. There are real concrete differences between groups of people. Men are different than women. Trans women are different than biological women. Of course, we can find differences between men and women. We can also find differences between men and other men. Shit, we can find differences between every unique individual cell in your body. Biological diversity is a thing, my dude. And that's to say nothing of the vastly different experiences between these groups. The experience of being black in America is worlds away from the experience, the privilege, of being white. So yes, there are real differences. But this folds perfectly into the thesis of this video. We have a choice. We can choose to focus on the differences between people, to take a narrow view of the self that contrasts with the other, or we can choose to see things as the same, to expand the self by noting we have more similarities than differences. One path leads to division, tribalism, and othering. The other path leads to community, cooperation, and egalitarianism. Like I said, I don't bring these ideas up because I'm trying to convince anyone to convert to Buddhism. Though, fair warning, we are going to talk about a lot of Eastern philosophy on this channel. It's one of my specializations. I'm bringing in this cosmic hippy-dippy shit because it's a beautiful refutation to our toxic mythology. If all we ever know is the mythology of tribalism, of self versus other, if it is the only water that we can swim in, how could we ever be persuaded to leave it? 
I'm introducing you to the idea of the jewel net. I'm making this whole video because I want to show you that there are other stories besides the one we are trapped in. Often, the only way to break free from a toxic story is to see what a good one looks like. Ask anyone who's been trapped in a shitty relationship. And our tribalist story is as toxic as it gets. It needs to be broken. See, it doesn't give rise to just the goblin beliefs. When we take this mythology of self versus other as gospel, as our immutable truth, it opens the door to fascism. And worse. So what is fascism? It's a tricky word because it's very often misused. I know what fascism is. It's when feminists tell me what pronouns to use, how to act, or when they call my masculinity toxic. That's fascism. No, fascism doesn't mean someone's telling me to do something I don't want to do. Roger Griffin defines fascism as a political ideology born from ancient myths of racial, cultural, and national origins. It is populist ultranationalism. Yale professor Jason Stanley offers the following definition. Fascism is an ideology based on power and loyalty. It's based on hyper-nationalism, so loyalty to one group, and one person, the leader, represents that group. It's hyper-masculine and hyper-patriarchal. This ultra-nationalism usually boils down to worshipping the in-group and demonizing the out-group. An obsession with the purity of races. Jews will not replace us! You see, fascism arises from the same toxic story as the goblin beliefs. It doubles down on the separation of self and other. It turns the tribalism up to ten. One people, one nation, and immigration! And it can be a very compelling story to desperate people. Go back to where you came from. Does it concern you? that many people saw that tweet as racist and that uh, white nationalist groups are finding common cause with you on that point. It doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. I Do not speak here. You don't belong here. Yeah, I don't country. care. I don't care. Your own I don't care. Go back to your country, my man. Go back to Asia. Go back to Mexico. Go really? back where you came from. Go back. Where are you from? So if you've ever wondered how the fuck did we elect Donald Donald Trump as president of the United States, how did he garner 73 million votes in 2020? Get the f out of my country! It's so obvious. He read from the same playbook fascists have been using to gain power for a century. By telling the same compelling story Hitler used to capture Germany. Your life sucks, and it's the dirty fucking foreigner's fault. When Mexico sends its people, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Illegal immigrants with criminal records are tonight roaming free to threaten peaceful citizens. Our plan will put America first. This hateful rhetoric is compelling in part because it is very sneaky. It is built on the story that everybody already believes. There is a self in conflict with an other. But the fascist adds this extra step of blaming the other for every ill of society. We want to get rid of this mess that China sent us. China virus. Kung flu. Chinese flu. The China flu. Chinese virus. Kung flu. Yeah. It's not racist at all, no. Not at all. It comes from China. This is how average, good-natured Germans became Nazis. And fascism is on the rise 
among the goblins living in the United States. The ten pillars of fascism are, number one, a mythic past, a great mythic past to which the leader harkens back. Number two, propaganda, uh, where everything is inverted. The news is the fake news. Uh, Anti-corruption is corruption. Three, uh, anti-intellectualism. Steve Bannon said, emotion, rage gets people to the polls. We got elected on lock her up and build the wall. Uh, Hitler and Mein Kampf says, you want your propaganda to appeal to the least educated people. Number four, unreality. You have to smash truth. So a reason gets replaced by conspiracy theories. Smash truth so all that remains is loyalty. Uh, hierarchy. The dominant group is better than everyone else. Victimhood. In fascism, the dominant group are the greatest victims. The men are the greatest victims of encroaching feminism. Uh, whites are the greatest victims uh, of blacks. Germans are the greatest victims mm. of Jews. Law and order. What are they victims of? They're victims of the outgroup who are criminals, the rapists, sexual anxiety. Pillar nine, Sodom and Gomorrah. The real values come from the heartland. Uh, the people in the city are decadent. And pillar 10 is Arbeit macht frei. Uh, work shall make you free. The outgroup is lazy. They're not just criminals, they're lazy. It's all about winning. I'm not gonna pretend to know the definitive solution to the rise of fascism in the United States. I'm saying we can understand fascism as a form of virulent tribalism, as the self versus other mentality taken to extreme. We can understand fascism as the expected endpoint to the central narrative we all implicitly believe. So a solution is to try and observe reality through the lens of the jewel net of Indra, to realize that we aren't separate tribes, we are all one tribe. I see where you're coming from, but I don't know. Things just seem to keep getting worse, more polarized. Are we even making any progress? We have absolutely made progress. The United States of America was born in blood a country stolen via genocide, the vindictive eradication of the native peoples. From day one, the tribe of white people saw themselves above the tribes of non-whites. Not just the genocide of the natives, but the enslavement of anyone with dark skin, a society structured around the subjugation of women and compulsory heterosexuality. This tribalist mindset is America's original sin, but we have made immense progress. The U.S. had its first tribalist reckoning in 1861, the American Civil War. Half the country believed in white tribe superiority so strongly that they seceded from the Union. They started a civil war in order to continue subjugating and owning the other. The northern half of the country had recognized the immorality of slavery, and Lincoln, the North, said, no, black people are people too, asterisk, and they must be freed from their bondage. The Union's success obviously didn't end racism, racial segregation, or even racial violence, but it was a step in the right direction, a step away from self versus other tribalism. Fifty years later, the women's suffrage movement hit its stride, successfully securing women the right to vote in 1920. This movement was the same fight against tribalism. All the dude-bro goblins of the early 20th century were saying, Men are superior to women. The self is better than the other. So the success of this movement was another blow to tribalism a blow to the misogynistic viewpoint that the tribe of women were incapable of rationality, that they didn't deserve to vote, that they were less than the tribe of men. Obviously, earning the right to vote didn't end sexism, discrimination, glass ceilings, and all the rest, but it was a step in the right direction. Another rejection of the self versus other mindset. Fifty years later, in the 1960s, Dr. Martin Luther King rose to prominence as the U.S. was again forced to address its racism. The Civil Rights Movement was fighting to eliminate Jim Crow laws, racial discrimination, 
ultimately it was continuing the fight against white tribalism. Dr. King was one of the most hated figures in America because all the white goblins believed these blacks are inferior to whites. The self is better than the other. And with the successes of the Civil Rights Acts of the 50s and 60s, the United States continued to march away from the self versus other tribalism. 50 years later, in 2015, the U.S. finally recognized that gay people are people too, and they have the right to get happily married and miserably divorced just like everybody else. And in response, all the conservative queer-phobic goblins lost their minds. <laughs> Marriage is defined as the union between one man and one woman. Gay people are morally inferior to the straights. The self is better than the other. This country is going straight to hell. I'm definitely in the closet, and I hate that I'm gay so much. So when the United States legalized gay marriage just a few years ago, we took a step away from the othering of homosexuality. My point is that history is always moving in this direction away from the tribalist mentality. In one of Martin Luther King's powerful speeches, he said, The dark of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I think we can modify that line to say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends away from tribalism. And we're saying the same thing. At the very least, it's historically accurate. To talk about slavery and the Civil War, about women's suffrage, about the gay rights movement, the trans rights movement, the groups that fought against bigotry, hatred, and tribalism were fighting on the right side of history. And every single one of these examples, and any other civil rights battle you can imagine, the moral side was the side fighting for inclusivity and equality fighting against tribalism. All of society's most pressing problems can be traced to this tribalist mentality. And history is always on the side of those working to eliminate the self versus other hierarchy. So if it's just our cultural mythology that teaches us this self-interested tribalism, if there are equally compelling stories that view the self and the other as one, and if the moral arc of history is rejecting this othering, I invite you to consider that the other is a myth. So I have a confession. The point of this video is not to convince the goblins to abandon their toxic beliefs. I'll be honest, I'm not sure how to really reach a goblin, other than to say, please don't be a goblin. Calling them goblins probably isn't helping. This outreach is something I'll explore in future videos. This video, though, has really all just been a setup to reach you the leftist viewer. The goblin beliefs are bad, fascism is terrifying, but there's one more strain of self versus other tribalism. It is more destructive than anything we've discussed so far, and almost all of you have been swept up in it, because it is the core belief of Western culture. The mythology of Western civilization is that humanity is separate from and above everything else. Philosopher Francis Cook, in his book titled Huayan Buddhism, writes that humanity still dwells comfortably in the pre-Copernican universe, where the whole world is a stage created for the most important of dramas, the human one. Despite Copernicus, we believe the universe revolves around us, the humans. The entire world here for humanity. Cook summarizes this whole mythology in a short poem. I met a toad the other day by the name of Wardy Bliggins. He was sitting under a toadstool, feeling contented. 
He explained that when the cosmos was created, that toadstool was especially planned for his personal shelter from sun and rain, thought out and prepared for him. Do not tell me, said Warty Bliggins, that there is no purpose in the universe. The thought is blasphemy. A little more conversation revealed that Warty Bliggins considers himself to be the center of the universe. The earth exists to grow toadstools for me to sit under, the sun to give me light by day, the moon and wheeling constellations to make beautiful the night sky for the sake of Warty Bliggins. In a few lines, this is the entire mythology of Western culture. Not that men are better than women, or that white folk are better than black, or that straights are better than gays. There are plenty of goblins who cling to these tribalist stories, but the one story that unites us all, goblins, fascists, and you, is the belief that the tribe of humans is above all other earthly tribes. So when we compile our list of goblin beliefs, our list of tribalism, our self versus other mythologies, there's one more to add to the list. I'm just introducing this idea now. We're gonna need a whole video to really dive in. But this is the source of the impending climate apocalypse. The core fundamental belief of our culture, our mythology, the water we are swimming in, is the belief that humans matter more than any other species. And here lies the true beauty of the jewel net of Indra. The Huayan Buddhist says, No, you silly Westerners, you misunderstand reality. When we destroy nature, we, we destroy, destroy ourselves. ourselves. We aren't separate from nature. We, we are nature. We, we are all one tribe. The tribe of Earthlings. So I'm assigning some fake homework for you fake students here in our fake classroom. Every single person watching this video is guilty of buying into at least one of these self versus other hierarchies. Maybe more than one. It's not your fault. This is the water we swim in every day. The mythology of self and other. So I challenge you to look inside yourself. To ask the difficult question, which are you guilty of? Which myth do you cling to? Who or what? do you other, and consider what it would mean to let go of that myth. Smash that like button, leave your comment, and subscribe, you silly Westerners.